Well, I have a story on Art Gensler. Um, you know, while I was at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and working on this um, uh, independent course called How Firms Got Started with uh, Will Cox, Will introduced me to Art Gensler. And uh, he uh, had interest in how I was thinking about starting my own firm. And over the years, you know, I never worked for art. And I didn't talk to him every day, of course. He's a busy man. But God, did, he didn't forget about me. Here and there when I call, you know, he would return my call. And so he was very helpful. So you know what? I want to help the next generation be successful and take care of their questions the way that art did for me. This interview is sponsored by the Architectural Foundation of San Francisco. AFSF is a nonprofit that provides technical training and mentorship to middle school and high school students who are considering a career in design. And today we have with us Eugene Sim of Sim Architects. Um, he's been kind enough to sit down with us today and share his experience. So Eugene, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, most welcome, uh, Zach. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. We're really excited. And if you don't mind, if we just jump right in, can you just tell us a little yeah. bit about yourself and your background? I, I, I'm Eugene Sim. Um, I'm the president and design principal at Sim Architects. And so a little bit of my background in brief. Um, I grew up in Asia on a U.S. military base, um, and uh, it really made a big impact on me over the years. Upon graduating from high school, I went on to study at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. What a change of pace that was. Uh, to pursue my studies in architecture, um, I was studying like crazy because I love this thing called architecture. And um, I was totally immersed in it. And I think I probably didn't uh, sleep that much. And I'm pretty sure other architects who talked to you would say the similar thing. That's about a pretty it. common story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, upon uh, then graduating from Rensselaer, I interned at the Hillier Group in Princeton, uh, New Jersey. Um, and while at Hillier, I realized that, wow, you know, I need even more education in order to move up this ladder. Wow. So I start to think about like what kind of things do I need to further um, develop myself into formally and uh, on-site training. So formally speaking here, I said, wow, that would be interesting if I got some other exposure as well, pursuing graduate studies. So I went on to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate studies, where I was able to meet some world-renowned architects, as well as to enroll in some additional courses at the world-class Wharton Business School. And guess what? Through that Wharton business experience, I met some of my future clients. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was a great, great people. Um, after completing my graduate studies uh, at UPenn, then I went back to West Coast to complete my additional training from a couple of preeminent architectural practitioners in California. Well, so kind of along the same lines of, of yeah. like becoming an architect, was there... You know, some people I talk to say that there was a specific moment when they knew that they were going to be an architect. It was, you know, I was seven years old and I was drawing or I was building something with Legos. And then some people kind of fell backwards into it. Where, where do you think you fall on that spectrum? Wow. Well, you got some um, very interesting, um, uh, you know, journey that others took. Well, mine is very unique. Um, I, I, from um, very early on, I, I took an IQ test. The counselor in this kindergarten said to my parents, you know, this is a young child. He has a wonderful knack for maybe being a surgeon or an architect. And out of the two, you know, I'm a, I'm a baby. <laughs> I, don't know what that means. <laughs> I, I know what doctors are, but architects, what is this? What is that? So ever since though, my parents instilled in me and they were open-minded, right? Uh, this curiosity about architecture and what architects do. And so that initial curiosity was so early on in my life. I did not have the tools to draw uh, really prolifically as I now do back then. And my interest was, as I was growing up, I loved geometry. I loved it. I loved math. I loved science, as well as building things, you know, for people. So my parents never pushed me to be a surgeon. It may have been more financial reward, maybe earlier on. But <laughs> as you've heard from other architects, 
ours is a long journey, long, long journey, right? But love it. And the more I get older and deeper, I love it more, right? Right. And, uh, so instead, they told me, you know, I could be successful in anything I choose in my field or any field, uh, as long as I pursued it with passion and conviction. That's all they gave me. And that instilled me the uh, joy of knowing that I had the full support to move into anywhere. And architecture was my goal from get-go. I love it. Oh, that's a great, lots of good things to unpack there. Yeah. Um, if you were going to have to pick one of the favorite things about your job, which, what would you say would be one of the, one of the most <laughs> just fulfilling parts of your job? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question because so many things to be uh, satisfied about in this architecture field. And I'm not just saying that. I think it's been pretty, you've know, probably heard it from others as well. But the, the most important thing, Zach, is that, um, that you know, uh, I like architecture because uh, I like to bring uh, through my own practice these compelling ideas, dreams, wishes, wants of my clients into reality. Um, and again, I, you can tell uh, I love architecture. I come to work every day, very excited to do some great work for my clients again uh, and society in general, because I love uh, how our architecture impacts the public. And it's a community um, building type of venue that allows people to come together. And again, I think Art Gensler told me one of my dearest mentors, client, you're in business and you're doing this beautiful thing called design because of clients. So right. yeah, that's important. And then I got a couple of examples here, not just talk about it, but there's one example that I just fondly recollect a lot is because I do a lot of churches and these um, contemplated reflective areas of uh, places where people could find peacefulness in this chaos and stress that we all go through, right? And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we finished a beautiful church structure that used daylight uh, and some other uh, semiotic features, right? Symbolism, these kind of things, liturgical things that create a place of mystery and reflections and contemplation. Well, I went back to visit that church. I do that once in a while. They're like our babies, right? I go, mm -hmm. how are they taking care of it? Oh, you know, and then I hear the good stories and, oh, you know, so we learned a lot these, uh, this way, right? So I visit the church recently and met a couple of elderly folks who I remember meeting during the grand opening celebration many years ago. Well, they came up to me and they still haven't forgotten me. And this guy, right? And then they broke up in tears though. I go like, why are they crying? Well, they told me they're emotional because they were also telling me that this building that we work together, again, I always think about buildings as collaboration. And they were telling me that they were moved spiritually uh, in this worship space that we designed together. Uh, they told me like how daylight moves through that church space, unlike anything they've ever seen in a very super mysterious way. I go like, wow. I don't know. I didn't do that. It just came about with a natural, sustainable design idea. So I was so moved by that one when people that's, crying in front of you, right? And hugging you like crazy. Right. Yeah. You know, that's so, so cool. Yeah. That is so cool to hear those types of stories. You know, like you talked about, you know, there, I'm sure there's things that you can design that are just mundane, you know, maybe yeah. <laughs> it's like a standard office building that's got nothing special about it. But, um, I think one of the reasons that most people become a, an architect or a designer is to be able to put your your stamp on the world, right? To be able to add something. And yeah. when you get to affect people like that on an emotional level, that's that's pretty special. So. Yeah. And these are the reasons why I became an architect. I love it. What would you say has been the hardest part of your journey so far? COVID-19 is super duper challenging, but that first commission, right. first client, that could entrust you with their design of the project, the structure, that was the most challenging. I, so guess what? My first client was Rose Padilla Johnson. She's the executive director. I think she's retired now of the Davis Street Community Center. The work uh, was won via uh, RFP, RFQ process, and we competed with some formidable area firms, very established firms. During the interview, the interview panelist asked me, how long has our firm been in existence? Wow. 
Gosh. <laughs> yeah. whoa, whoa. You know, and, and, and we have to be honest and we have to be truthful and what it is, right? So I replied that I had only started a couple months ago in a very humble voice and looking downward because I knew this isn't going to get us a project. Uh, I was uh, telling them that, um, you know, humbly speaking, uh, Rose, um, I just started <laughs> and um, that I was looking for this project, first project uh, as an opportunity, right? To make sure our first um, opportunity like this would become the very best project ever for us as a firm, as myself, as an architect. And I had punched out with a lot of energy and zest on that. And then I said, by the way, if we don't get this project or we do not perform well for you on this project, we will close our business. Well, guess what? I guess my answer was good enough to convince her and her committee to hire us over the other established firms. And this is back 25 years ago. Yeah. So that was a challenging experience for me. And there you go, trials and tribulations. Oh, but, but we delivered on it because it was not about money making. It was about making sure that statement that I made at that room was going to be fulfilled. And we right. did that. So, uh, so that, that's one. And then, you know, as you uh, may or may not know, I started this from scratch. I didn't have a rich uncle. I right. didn't have anything. I had no partners, no teammates to find solace and comfort. I did this all from ground zero by myself without any fat financial backing from anyone, period. So when I also uh, got started, I, I called on my previous contacts who were my clients when I was associated with other firms. They told me to call them when I got settled first and perhaps in a couple more years down the road when I can show some evidence of uh, they didn't say it that way. They just said, you know what, you're going to yeah. go through some great learning and, right. and great business. And I'm so happy you're starting this business. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, so I told them, hey, my friends, I need work now as I need to get this business going. Guess what? They never called me back. However, now after some 25 years in business, guess what? These same folks, I, I still think they're my friends. Uh, they start calling me again. And wow, you know, it's taken 25 years to prove that we are in fact established enough to start being considered for their projects. So that's right. the trial and tribulation story, my friend. I love it. We covered a couple of things there, but the most important thing that is a lesson, I think that just stretches across all of entrepreneurship is you're going to have to find somebody who believes in you, right? yeah. somebody who yeah. says, I, yeah, I will be your first client, right? When you don't have necessarily the body of work yet right. to be able to show people. Right, um, right. It is a leap of faith, right? It is just sometimes you're asking somebody for an absolute leap of faith, but uh, when it works out, boy, it really works out. So that's yeah. a great story. I love that. Were there any particular leaders that come to mind uh, in architecture, someone that you admire uh, or maybe has inspired you in some way? Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of people there on that list of, of my um, of mentors who I'm fully indebted to. Um, but one person uh, to be really focused would be Bob Hillier. Um, Bob Hillier, he's a founder of the Hillier Group in Princeton, and he's my inspiration. Bob grew his practice from just himself with one junior drafter, uh, and then it grew to 30 staff, and then at some point it grew to 80, and then it grew to 150 staff when I returned for some summer experience, and then 300 plus staff with five offices throughout the U.S. when I was leaving him to pursue graduate school. So I saw firsthand how this growth, uh, rapid growth uh, could occur, and I most admired him and, and the team there because they were able to grow this fast, but at the same time, they really preserved their quality of the work and also their reputation. And so that's something that always is in my uh, mindset about how Bob did that. And, and he just kept the quality still in, entrenched, even when he went from two-man office to 350-plus-man office. You know, 
you mentioned Art Gensler earlier. Yeah. I never, I never got to meet Art, unfortunately. He was actually, uh, he was a huge friend of the foundation and he was gonna do one of these interviews not long before he passed and then he got sick um, and he passed earlier this year. But when, when you talk about somebody who is yeah. just a very good yeah. human being that scales, yeah. that just that name sticks, uh, sticks out to me. Um, yeah. It's an impressive thing. Right. It's an impressive thing to be a really good human being and live by these morals and values. Right. And then also take this and and scale it, right? And make it, you know, yeah. make it something larger. Um, there's not too many people that can do that well. So. Well, I have a story on Art Gensler. Um, you know, while I was at the uh, University of Pennsylvania and working on this um uh specialized uh class course, uh, independent course called How Firms Got Started with uh, Will Cox. He was a legendary pioneer and consultant. He's now passed away, sadly to say so, but he was the guru of architectural practice formations and strategies and organization formations. And he was Art Gensler's guru when Art was with his wonderful, wonderful Mrs. Gensler starting from their home and to go into this new uh, journey. Um, so what I do is I wrote a business plan through Weld, um, and it was a strategic plan. And so through that process of formulating the strategic and business plan, Weld introduced me to Art Gensler, David Robinson, Ron Altoon, who used to be the president of AI in LA, and Michael Bobro, Julia Thomas, the legendary uh, medical uh, practice that's in LA, uh, on how their firms got started. And so uh, it was very uh, instructional and revealing at that time for me, because this is a guy who was just in architecture designing. And I go like, wow, you know, there's, right. there's things to know about this practice so that I can be a better designer and create that vision for a practice down the road that is uh, design centered. So uh, out of this group, though, Art was the mentor who provided most, most attention to this a young man. Um, and uh, he uh, had interest in how I was thinking about starting my own firm. And over the years, you know, I never worked for art. And I didn't talk to him every day, of course, he's a busy man. But God, did, he didn't forget about me here and there when I call, you know, he would return my call. And so, you know, when you start a firm, you know, you got lots of questions, yeah. even with the best laid out plans, right. And then so he was very helpful. So you know what, just like art did for me, I want to help the next generation be successful and take care of their questions the way that art did for me. So that's oh, really that's art against awesome. it for me. I yeah. love it. I love yeah. hearing those stories and I love your pay it forward mentality. Yeah. And, and one other thing I wanted to let you know, before I started this, I was um, um, in a senior role, um, uh, getting to become potentially a partner material with three other senior architects, but they wanted me as a youngster to do it their way. And I wanted to do my thing uh, that I thought was right. And I thought authentically and genuinely, this is what I wanted to do with my practice and design. So um, at some point, uh, the the rude awakening came. It was the um, bubble, the dot com. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the, so the economy went upside down. And that's when I said, oh, boy, I'm going to do this on my own. Then. And so it was but the best decision I ever made to break away and start. I love it. That's great. That's great advice. I know there's people out there right now getting ready to start their own firm and they need yeah, to hear stuff it. like that. So yeah. tell them to give me a call. I love it. I will. Um, you know, Eugene, if we were going to finish up on just the last question, as we're talking yeah. about the next generation, yeah, we always like to end with what is the best advice that you could give to an up and coming design professional? So whether that's someone that's just graduating school mm -hmm. or someone that's just getting licensed or someone that is, you know, like we're talking about ready to kind of venture out on their own and hang a shingle and, and start a firm. Mm -hmm. I would say, uh, study and observe other established architects and see the different styles and apply those styles to you to see if it fits you. Gotcha. See what works for you and discard those that don't work for you. So that's one thing that I, I see because I've done that with Art Gensler, Bob Hillier, right? Mm -hmm. I've looked at that. 
And then finally, I think one thing that I, it comes to my mind uh, uh, is uh, something that um, that has been ingrained in me is that everything is a living situation. Always expect the unexpected. It's mm. good advice. That's what I would say. That's too. really good advice, actually. That's I. I've not. I ask this question a lot, and I've not had somebody say that yet. Which is, it's a great piece of advice. You know, I think of a designer, and I think of somebody who's an artist and a problem solver at the same mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of being a business owner is trusting your ability to solve problems. Yeah, there's stuff that you just can't anticipate. COVID, we had right. no idea in April of 2020 that COVID was going to hit. But you have to trust your ability to solve problems, right? right? And if you can trust your ability to solve problems, oh man, you know, yeah. you can make it through pretty much anything. Oh, Eugene, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. Um, really, really appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. I know you and I have been chatting for yeah. a while about doing this. And I'm, <laughs> I'm really glad we were able to make this happen. So thanks yeah. so much for joining us this, this afternoon. Most welcome, Zach. Uh, likewise, uh, my best regards to you. 